to the mass public. I, I just never understood that. Well, that it starts in hypocrisy by like major artists. That's how that starts. It, and a perfect example is Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. Their bio that they sent to labels to other you know, when they were just a garage band, it was like, we're going to be superstars, rock stars. This is it. You're you going to want to hear us. It's like it was a, all about fame. But as soon as it happened, <laughs> and it, 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 doesn't, it didn't reflect in the songs, but the, the concept and the idea was we have this model of great music, but we want it to be everywhere and we want to be huge. And then it happened, and Kurt was like, well, this is not what I thought that was going to be, and obviously had his own demons and, and issues to deal with. But um, it's it's from that. It's from artists that are um, in their own genre, what they think is, is uh, something that, that is, is just writing a song and putting it out there to formulating something that other people want to buy. And when you become successful, no matter who it is and how original you are, your second album, they're going to want you to do that again. So even if you're the most original person, as soon as someone tells you, just keep being original, but like how this is, it, it happens. And it just it's a natural progression in life. You have to kind of deal with it. <laughs> Side question before I move on here, seeing as you brought him up. If Kurt Cobain was still alive today, this is obviously just pure, pure opinion base. If yeah. Kurt Co Cobain was still alive today, how big is Nirvana? Or are they still pumping out music? Did they, did they kind of fade off years ago? What do you think? Well, I mean, I remember, well, it was my birthday when he was discovered on 94 or 5, right? 4? 95? I think it was, 90, 90, I think it was 94. 90, but 94? It was April 7th, like he died on the 5th and he was discovered on the 7th because I remember I was in Brandon, Manitoba on in our van going, whoa, what the hell happened here? But at that point, Nirvana was like, they were playing arenas, but they weren't playing Smells Like Teen Spirit and it was getting to that point where they weren't on the top of the charts with In Utero, the same they were. So I think if they would have continued, they probably would have maybe declined a little bit in terms of uh, at that time. And Kurt probably would have done his own music, which would have been fantastic as well. But Nirvana would have got huge and so, still have been a, this classic thing because that first record was so impactful. And in Euro was, uh, again, an, a fantastic record that probably would have just propelled as a classic album. Well, I, I'll say just to kind of close this off on, on the, the Nirvana stuff. With due respect to Our Lady Peace or any other band for that matter, uh, you know, you get asked that question from time to time on Twitter or amongst friends, whatever, you know, if you get, if you're stuck on an island with one album or whatever it may be, to me, greatest album of all time was the Nirvana Unplugged, the MTV Unplugged album. I could listen to that thing front to back literally every day of my life. There's not a bad track on that thing. I love, love listening to it, whether it's on CD, on vinyl, download or otherwise, that to me was a masterpiece. And that's coming from a huge Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers fan. But I would take Nirvana unplugged every day of the week, 10 times over. It's that's, to me incredible. When you're like, you know, making rope on an island all day with like palm <laughs> leaves and you got nothing to do but yeah. make yeah. stuff and deal. Oh, yeah. like that's yeah. the jam. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I gotta, it's going to be a real mellow island. <laughs> I'm going to be real depressed when I finally get saved. <laughs> I, bet, I bet you two days in, you're like, man, I wish I picked Graceland. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so let, let me ask you. Let's get to the current day stuff then. You, 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 you ultimately, you, you, you leave the band, but you haven't left music, but you're looking for something creative, something new. All of a sudden, pretty quickly... The, the podcast starts and it takes off. Taggart and Torrance. You end up hooking up with, with Jonathan Torrance. Yeah. Like for, for the hardcores that are watching, they know the story. For those that aren't as familiar, how does that connection start, that bond, that friendship, that partnership start uh, in the infancy? And bef we'll talk about before it really takes off. Uh, I met Jonathan when the Trailer Park Boys were uh, emceeing the Gravity Tour, like in 2000 two or one they were out on the road with us and became friends with the boys in my clattenburg and that's how i got to know jonathan i think he came out to a show in like oh four oh five 
and we just just kept in touch and always kind of always wanted to do something together and i think when i heard him on the the jay and dan pod which i had done a couple times yep um and the way they are with their their media knowledge and humor um I, I think that just kind of melded in my my mind. It's like, well, why don't I just try doing a podcast with with Jonathan? That'd be great. And uh, that was it. We just started doing it on SoundCloud and then put it on iTunes, and it just blew up. I think we've had uh, um, over four million downloads, and uh, we have a great uh, listenership and very active amount of people that that are kind of connected with us and keep in touch with us and go through every day with us it's really uh become a, an amazing thing what was there any convincing that needed to be uh happening or was it just because you guys were tight because you were friends and you knew each other it's like hey let's just do this and did you go in as thinking or hoping that this would turn into something or was it just something that at, at least in the infancy was let's just do this for fun and see what happens yeah well i mean I- I, I think it came from every time I spoke to Jonathan on the phone, we would be laughing the whole time, you know? So I'm like, well, what the hell is a podcast other than content? So yeah. if, we're, if we're laughing, then people will probably start laughing along with us. And that really is what the, the podcast is, is our connecting weekly and uh, seeing what's going on. And then we play a couple games really lightly or talk about what's happening and or play some tunes it's really uh it's no different than if you were like at your buddy's garage for an hour you know just hanging out you know i i find it funny as well i remember listening back uh you know well i mean i didn't i didn't I, i'll be i'm being honest with you right here i didn't listen to the first one when it was first released but i remember listening to the first one probably two three years ago going back and i i sat one night i, I was on the road and I don't remember where I was. I was on the road somewhere, somewhere in the NBA circles. I want to say it was yeah. Denver or something. I, but I remember listening to that very first podcast and ended up banging out about five or six, just laying there in the hotel nice. room and, and, and listen to the, listen to the podcast. And then I started listening more regularly. But I remember that first one where you guys were talking and joking about the fact that you had like a couple, two or two or 3,000 followers on Twitter, but you hadn't even done a show yet. And then just yeah. kind of turning the microphones on for the first time. Yeah. When when did you know? What episode was it, or how long into this process did you really realize that you kind of had something cooking here, and that that there were there were more followers than maybe you would have expected, or that more followers and more listeners than a lot of podcasts? Yeah. Well, I think when we uh, when we did our first show, we did a show at the Rivoli, and it was yeah. packed, and, and it was really an awesome experience, and. Um, I, 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 so we felt that, uh, there's definitely people there and they're listening. So we were like, well, maybe we should write a book. <laughs> so <laughs> we called up Har- Harper Collins and they're like, yeah, let's do it. So that kind of took us to a different level. And, uh, here we are now with Dine Alone Records making an album and that'll be coming out at the, uh, in June. So uh, we've had three, our third singles coming up in a couple weeks, um, but I mean that's a whole other side of it that that's that's amazing. So to be uh, to have a record coming out and and to, to have written a book and just to kind of I mean the the show and the the podcast is about Canadian culture and living here. So these are all uh, even and pretty pretty natural extensions from that. So. I want, I want to hit on each of those individually because I, I find each of them unique. I, I'm going to start with the live show. There's one thing, as you said, to be turned on your mics and it's just a couple of guys in their garage having a conversation and, and, and talking back and forth. There's another thing. And, and, hey, you're both performers, Jonathan in television for years and you as a mu- musician. But it's still different, I would yeah. think at least, doing a live show, a live podcast, having an audience in front of you that's, you know, reading your body language, your facial expressions, et cetera. What you think might be funny isn't as funny to the dude that's sitting in the first row and yeah. you're feeding off the energy or the lack thereof. That's daunting in itself. So the fact that you were able to make that transition mm-hmm. successfully to not just one venue, but then to take this thing on the road and have a tour, that's that's pretty incredible. I think that, that you guys were able to have the foresight to do that, to try that and to have it take off and succeed. Yeah, well, I mean, we dipped our toe in the water hoping that people would enjoy the show, but, like, we had the shows, and, and we were getting 
that feeling of, of a great live experience. So um, I, I think it, it was a high laugh per minute. You know, so that that usually relates to a good live show. So that's why it, it has continued and uh, will again, even though we probably won't be seeing live shows until maybe next fall, I'm hearing, 2021 or something, which is insane to think about. Yeah. But, yeah. but stuff like this is growing. And I do believe that live online shows is side door access is a is a as a website and a, a company that that allows artists and comedi- comedians and bands to play shows in their normal kind of community privately in houses but since this quarantine they've kind of uh, taken on the the idea of like no let's do online shows and Dan Mangan just did a show a couple of days ago 300 people all kind of watching the show and it's like you know a low ticket price but it's it's a valid uh, form of of live music now. So things are changing, man. Things are changing every day. It's crazy the, well, the landscape. It, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. Like it's 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 to me um, the access we were talking about that earlier. The access that you can now provide to 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 viewers, to listeners, to fans, whatever it may be. And then and honestly, just the the uh, anybody at home that that has uh, you know access or opinion or opportunity and they want to try something start something you never know uh yeah. what may or may not, may not take off and and i mean you know it's it's there's a double-edged sword to it i think when there's a a ton of content that's out there and, and it gets sort of oversaturated um but at the same time i think that conversations with the same person can be completely different obviously depending on who the person is asking the questions or who the person is yeah you know who the, sure. who the two three four people are that are talking it's just yeah. uh I don't know. I, I, I find I find that unique and interesting. Just to me, this hopefully people find this interesting. But this to me is what I've always enjoyed over the course of my career. Even just as again as a fan, part of what I enjoyed most about news talk or sports talk, and even to this day, I'm a huge, huge, huge Howard Stern fan. And not because of the you know the the off color jokes or the cursing and swearing and the TNA and everything else. No, it's it's his interviews when he has musicians, actors, whomever it may be. When he actually sits down to talk to somebody. That to me is the stuff that I find more fascinating than anything else. Well, he's a great interviewer too. He can get anybody, like he can get the best out of everybody. Like all of a sudden, you know, Hillary Clinton's talking about being in bed, and you know, you know, like it, it's it's crazy where he can lead a conversation, and that's why he's getting paid a hundred million dollars a year, or whatever the hell it is. Now, for you guys to do the podcast live shows, and then as you said. Oh, let's just try a book. We can make this into a book again. <laughs> yeah. You're kind of you're not you're not giving yourself enough credit here. Yeah. But to to take everything you're doing on a on a podcast in a show and then to put it to page to put it to print, I'm sure that's a fun creative process. But at the same time, if somebody said to me, "Oh, you know, you should write a book," it would take a hell of a long time. I would think to pare down the stories you have, the ideas you have, the the examples you have of uh, you know things across Canada, what makes things all Canadian, everything else. So actually, again, to think it's funny to you, it's funny to Jonathan, is it going to be funny to readers? Is it going to be funny to our publishers? How was that process for you guys sitting together to actually write a book? Because that's a different beast in itself. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I, I, I had been talking to Doug Richmond at the time, at, to HarperCollins, just previous to, about a book about my childhood and my dad. And I had given him a couple excerpts and ideas. So he he, uh, he was kind of keen into the idea of a book. He, um, at that point, he was, uh, I think, what what ended up coming is like it would be a hell of a lot easier for him to sell a Taggart and Torrens book than just a Jeremy Taggart book, you know, because the Taggart and Torrens book was about Canada and our stories across the country and my book was about my dad and very personal and it made sense that, that uh, a TNT book would be easier, an easier pitch and probably a better seller. And it, it, it proved to be that because um, having Jonathan involved gives a whole other perspective of uh, his views uh, of his stories in Canada and being an entertainer and my side with the music and then pairing everything together with just uh, how awesome this country is and, 
you know, what we love about each city. So um, it, it made it, 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 it was, it, but it was difficult to, to sit, sit down and, and, and write. It, it's a very hard thing to, uh, to, to, to accomplish, but uh, I'm glad we did it. And I think I probably would be happy to do it more in the future. And I wouldn't be so apprehensive in the future to do it because uh, I think I can accomplish more. You know what I mean? My, my head yeah. in a better, a better place. Are there things that you left out of the book that you would wish either A, you had put in the book or B, you can definitely put in the second version uh, nope. or whatever when, when you when you do that next book? And, you know, is there enough content, you think, to pump out another one? I, uh, there's a couple of things that I'm glad I took out of the book, uh, which were about my brother, which were very personal stuff, things. My brother who passed away last year, but my uh, my stories about him just because he's such an interesting person and character um they were a little bit in negative light just because of how um off the wall he he you know was so um i i i think those stories need to be told but um just because they're great stories and he's an incredible person as my father is and i think that's why books should be written is just is because of the stories that that lie there and i think both of them are pretty incredible people that i i was able to observe enough interesting situations that it would definitely make a a good read <laughs> jeremy that kind of ties to ties into me at least into what we were talking about a little bit earlier um in terms of how much you how much you reveal or how much you 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 share of yourself yeah. How much of a challenge? How much of a challenge was that, or is that for you to 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 decide uh, what you want to talk about and 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 how open you want to be, or or is that part of maybe your therapy talking about it and and making sure those stories live on? Well, I think it's got to be honest and and as open and raw as you can be without uh, you know and telling that story. You know, you have to kind of let it out. So uh, there was an element of like, well, this is a little personal, but at I mean, that's life. You have to jump in, right? Yeah. I want to ask you before we go here, because we've got about you know five or six minutes left here, and I appreciate your time over the course of the, almost an hour here. Um, yeah. You mentioned you mentioned now we we, we went, went went from the podcast to the live shows to the book, but the records now. Um, yeah. I guess this is this is a perfect way to wrap because it comes full circle back to the music. Um, Dine Alone Records and and the album coming out in in uh, in June. Yeah. How how fun has that been for you to just simply get back to the musical side, even if it's you know in a humorous way as well, and to be doing that and sharing yeah. yet another creative avenue with Jonathan? Uh, it's awesome to go into the studio with a blank palette. And um, what's cool about this record is it's not just one style of music; it's all characters from our podcast doing different songs. So, for example, our first song was. Gordon Lightfoot rap song called The Score. <laughs> and the second song was called Weekend Bumsies by Andrea from Cape Breton, who Jonathan portrays. And our next single is a guy, it's uh, called uh, uh, You Selling on Byron. And it's By Byron who runs a uh, swap shop. And it's just like he buys anything. Yeah. So it's that that's our that's going to be our next single and we just finished the video for that so it'll be coming out on the 24th. It, has it been fun for you though to kind of get back to, again I know you said you didn't stop playing but to be kind of in that musical forum again even if it's with sort of a, a humorous spin to it to kind of yeah. get back to to creating again and, and to playing music. For sure and like I said to be doing hip hop and then country and then like weird rock and like there's a Gino Vanelli jam so it's like there's just <laughs> different styles of music and yeah. to be able to play with great musicians like Tim Oxford from the Arkells was engineering the record and Anthony Carone played some keyboards and, and uh, Aaron Goldstein and Adam Baldwin we had a lot of really great uh, people involved with the record so it was fun it was really a good time. I, I don't know if you've ever heard or seen the story, and if you haven't, you got to go check it out on YouTube. But have you heard the the connection with um, with with Gino Vanelli and the Boston Celtics? Have you heard this before or no? No. 
What? So, Can you give me the jerk, quick synopsis? So the really awesome. quick, because yeah, we're probably we're coming up to the end of the I hour. And the, the, one, the one thing I've learned doing this show is Instagram gives you about a 30 second warning and boom, oh. you're done. You get, you, get, <laughs> okay. you, get, you get 60 minutes and you're gone. You're off. Oh. Um, so during like the, the height of their, 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 you know, the like at least within the last 10, 15 years, you know, when we're talking about um, Paul Pierce and Rajon Rondo and, and Kevin Garnett, etc. Yeah. Um, they used to play an old clip and I want to say that it was from Soul Train where there was a dude in a tight, I mean, tight, 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 like boat neck t-shirt, like down to here with the sleeves that came up to the shoulders. And it was just painted on. I mean, it was like the tightest t-shirt ever, long hair, beard, like meticulous beard, and just had like the, the disco moves, but he had a Gino and it was a Gino Vanelli t-shirt from like the like oh, late seventies, nice. early eighties. And, and like, that was the only Gino Vanelli connection to it, but they would play the song and play that, that video when the Celtics were blowing somebody out. No so six, six minutes left in the fourth quarter, four minutes left, two minutes left, whatever it might be, that's the song and the jam they would play with this dude doing his thing. And it became this sort of like this, this, this cultural thing, this sort of, it, it was part of the game ops. And the yeah. Celtics were beating everybody all the time. Like this, destroying people. And the amount of times I saw it when the Raptors would go to town. <laughs> Every and time you're there, you see if you, I'm telling you, if you go on YouTube and Google it, You'll see there's like KG, like Garnett would be looking up at the screen. They're laughing at this thing. They're looking up at this dude with the Gino Vanelli t-shirt. And then it got to the point where it became such this, this cult classic thing where the players would be pointing like, play Gino. And they'd be getting the game ops guy, like put Gino up on the board. What, you know, what, like, so, what song would they play? It, it wasn't a Gino Vanelli oh, song. It was just like, it was just, no, it was just like some 70s disco, but he had the Gino shirt. So. I think they ended up doing some sort of a, a fun thing with Gino Benelli himself at a Celtics game, but it was just, I don't know. Didn't I mean to take that Gino. off the rails oh, a bit here, but good. Yeah. I love a Gino Benelli story. So, you, you, you gotta go, you gotta go check that one out at some point. It was, I it was, know. it was great. All right. Last one for you here, because as a, at least as a sports guy, you, you sure. started with the baseball, the baseball was put on hold to suddenly boom, get into music. Yeah. Where, how, what the golf, cause you're a hell of a golfer. I mean, how did that? How did that happen? Because I mean, how do you go from being a drummer on the road and, and and as busy as you are and everything to suddenly being one hell of a golfer and having that that sports itch as well? Well, I think I, I some people be, you know maybe get a cocaine habit going or something. I decided to go with golf. <laughs> yeah. And on, on yeah, so like I was because when you're on the road, there's nothing to do ever. And and to be honest, like this quarantine that we're in is very much like being on the road for like eight months where you're like in a hotel room you don't want to go out there's nothing you're just kind of stuck sitting in a room and that's the closest thing i can feel to that but yeah like literally uh yeah that's, that's, <laughs> I, I, I mean it's, I, I you think know. you probably made the, the good choice. Cocaine yeah. versus golf. I think, yeah. Well, I mean, but by, by by when you're when you're sitting on the road with nothing to do, you you have a sound check at four o'clock. You know, so golf good. is perfect to take that nine to two in the afternoon spot away, so you're not going crazy. So golf, I just would golf all the time and spend my days on the road, like trying to find golf courses, and I just got pretty good at it by. You know, all my buddies are golfers, so that's literally it. It's a good hobby if you have a lot of spare time. But you need the and spare it, time. It, now I yeah, you need, you need, you need the spare time, time. yeah. You need, you need to live, like, kind of north of the city so you got yeah. more options, yeah. Yeah, yeah that helps, that helps, yeah. that helps. Definitely, uh, I do li love it, though. Listen, man, this has been awesome. I appreciate you doing this. Um, and, and you mentioned the quarantine. I hope you and your family, everybody's safe and healthy and uh and and you know, I hope hopefully see you in person on the other side of this. But uh, this this was this was awesome to do. All right, and and I guess that I might be hearing you like doing empty arenas. That's like maybe in the next year or so. Like that that might happen before people being in the arena, right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, listen, uh, Let's see. What, whatever it takes, right? Whatever it yeah, takes. Exactly. It just, sure. I think I think we need it back to have the outlets yeah. more than anything. But I mean, I don't, it, I don't think the fans care about the no fans. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just they something just, to watch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thanks.